Hello, my friends. We are talking today about the CAPM exam. And one of the questions that people typically have is, well, the exam hasn't changed. PMI has been promising it will change, but is there agile on the exam? So today to answer the question, we have one of our friends, Farouz, who got certified some weeks ago. And Farouz, I'm going to ask you the question. First of all, is there agile on the CAPM exam? Yes, there is agile in the CAPM exam. Um, there is like, um, I would say 10% direct question about agile and maybe uh, another 10% uh, agile situational questions. Wow. Yes, questions like, um, for example, um, you are doing this in predictive, what would you do in an agile? Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. I see. Wow. They give you something you do in predictive and kind of like what is the equivalent of this in in agile, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Wow. Um That's however, what you have done in the agile section, I didn't even review it, so it was sufficient. Mm. So yes. Mm. That is very helpful. So for those people who haven't really paid attention to um, Agile, you will get Agile on the exam. The question is, you know, are you going to be able to handle it like Farouz did? I believe the reason why she was able to handle it is we went pretty deep into Agile compared to what the exam presents. Right, Farouz? Yes, exactly. Yes. Good, good. Okay. So overall, would you say like, 20% of the exam was agile or something like that? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yes. Um, I think they are introducing like progressively more agile in the mm -hmm. exam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as far as the difficulty level of the exam, you've been through our training. You did pretty much everything that we're doing now with our friends who are on the call. Um, are there any specific areas that jump out in your mind as far as things, knowledge areas, concepts that they should pay more attention to? Anything like that? Um, I would say that um, um, like you have to have, um, um, in my sense, uh, like detailed, uh, a detailed view of the, the ITTOs because there was they were given like questions and answers like uh, uh, like the inputs or the outputs of a process is A B C D or A B D E or things oh. like that. So, like you have to to know generally. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes it was. It was like more, um, um, I would say it in French, <laughs> like, uh, like you have, for example, sometimes there is like, uh, I would say like traps, not traps, but okay, <laughs> red herring <laughs> traps, yes, but tricks. uh, it was like six questions like this, so you have to know, like. Uh, the four inputs of something or mm -hmm. the, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to know your inputs. It's not negotiable. Otherwise, you could be in trouble if you don't know your inputs, huh? Yeah, Output. and even, yeah, even tools and techniques. There, there were lots of tools and techniques. Um, I was writing a lot on the whiteboard. Okay. Yes, because I've done, like, um, I told you the last time, some Nemo technique in mm -hmm. order to yes so i was writing like the inputs and the outputs uh other than that um they they there were lots of questions about the role of projects with projects manager okay. okay um uh like they 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 were like situational questions and the answer is you will do this this or this uh it is the sponsor that uh, or the sponsor will do this and this and this. So, mm. which will, yeah. And that was the area which I got targets. I didn't have any 
uh, uh, there is target above target and the other one like less than target yeah, below target yeah <laughs> yeah so uh that was the only one i got the target in the all the um, all the areas i got above target and i think that i should have um uh i should have like paid paid attention more to the role of project manager mm, chapter um, three yeah yeah okay um, there weren't a lot of questions on procurement. Okay. Um, questions about environment. Is this the, the internal, external environment? Or these wow. are, yeah. EEFs and OPAs. Internal OPAs. EEFs. Oh, my gosh. So chapter yeah. two, folks, you got to pay attention to external EEFs, internal EEFs is what uh, Farouz is saying. So this is good information. It's like the little, tiny little details, you got to pay attention to them to be able to, uh, with ease, sail through the way she did. Um, mm. And um, uh, uh, yes, the, 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 the first 50 questions were, were the hardest one. Hmm. After hmm. that, I spent like uh, one, hour and 15 minutes on the first question so i will tell myself that i will be behind the the type however the the second and the third section were were easier um i think there were also the uh, the questions that uh there isn't a score on i don't know how they are called oh yeah the pretest questions uh -huh. yes and sometimes i tell myself maybe <laughs> it is there the uh, non-test question piece. yes because there was there were uh, like uh, a lot of questions when you just hesitate be between answer but generally there is two false answers that that you see uh directly after the question and two answers that you have to choose uh between them gotcha yeah so it was like a question with two answers mm. <laughs> yeah Good to know. Good stuff. Well, thank you for answering these uh, questions that I asked. I believe everything else pretty much is clear for me. What about our friends on the call? Have you got any questions that you would like Farouz to answer for you? Farouz, would you say there were a lot of trick questions where all the answers are right, but maybe one or two words changed it to be the better of all the right answers? Generally, that uh, there were two false answers that you'll see directly. <laughs> I'm sure, Stacy, you will <laughs> identify them. Um, maybe um, five percent questions that will, that when you have to like choose the right one between the four answers. But generally, all the questions you have to choose between two right answers. And you could like scratch off on the computer. Was it like a screen where you could like put a mark through if you know you didn't want this answer or anything or? Um, I, I didn't understand. Like, a, was it like a touch screen? Like how Phil does on his screen where he'll like mark through, we know it's not A because that's not even a right term. We know it's not B because that's planned procurement management or whatever the case was. Could you like mark out like on the screen? Out. There, like there, there is for rules. Isn't there's a strikeout tool, isn't there? So if you've got like option A, option B, option C, you can use a tool on the screen, right? For rules to cancel like that to strike um, out. Or you didn't I, use that. I didn't do it, so I don't mm. know if there is something like that. But so there uh, is, yeah, there is. So if you had like an option one. And then an option two, and you just want to think straight, and you want to can you want to just uh, cancel that so that you don't worry about it anymore. You can do that. Another tool that they have there is the highlighter tool. So if you want to highlight the text, there's a tool for that as well, where you can highlight the option. You got those? Yeah, those are standard for P PMI exams. Yeah, okay. I, I was much more using the whiteboard. So okay. yes, so I I'm someone uh, I I need to write to <laughs> mm -hmm. to yes to write like with a pen or <laughs> gotcha good deal mm -hmm. 
And do you used all the full time, right, Farouz? Or did you have a lot of time left? Uh, I had um, 20 minutes left. Um, that was the time when I reviewed the flagged questions. I flagged like, uh, I would say, 10 to 12 questions. And I did change like three or four. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, because I, I I think that the first um, the first questions you are a little bit more stressed, so sometimes you will miss some of them, and uh, I think that the, the the first questions you need to that's when you need maybe to flag more questions than the other one because you get to you you become more uh, focused after mm -hmm. the first questions. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. Good deal, Farouz. Well, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom on this. And before we round up this section, we're waiting for our PMP friends to get here. They're a little bit behind. But um, before they get here, I want to talk to you about taking multiple choice questions, because I know lots of people have this nervousness about tests. And I just want to assure you that a lot of the things you need to do, you probably have already done them just by virtue of you being in this class. So I call it the smart guy to take in multiple choice question exams. The very first thing I want you to be aware of is if you plan well, you've got a better chance of success. Poor planning is one of the biggest reasons for failing the exam. People don't research the exam enough. They don't even have a clue what to expect. I was reading a note from someone the other day who said, Phil, I didn't know I was going to have as much agile on the exam. What? Are you kidding me? You didn't know PMI put agile in the exam. They upped the ante since 2018 even, right? They'd been showing a little bit of agile interest. And then 2020, they just went full Monty on everyone. And it was 50%, 50%. So agile has been huge since, you know, going to three years. So you got to do good research. You got to, you, you got to find, you know, the, the question behind the question. I call it the QBQ. And it's not just a fancy play on words. Behind every question, there, there really is a, another question, right? The question behind the question. They're asking you for um, why or what the SPI is, right? But the real question is, uh, what does it mean? The question behind them asking you about SPI is not just for the numbers. It's really to check, do you know the performance, how to check performance of schedule versus how to check performance of cost? Because sometimes they could try to trick you by asking you one thing, but the question is really asking for another if you read it carefully. And when people fail to, to find the real question, they have a preconceived idea, they go off and choose something wrong. And I see that happening all the time, you know, like last week when we were doing this question about capacity, or the other day, two days ago, we're doing capacity, and the question was asking, the question was asking, what should you not deduct in capacity? And you shouldn't deduct the time that you are available to work, of course. But the, that was the question behind that question was, do you know what to deduct in capacity planning and what not to? So if you don't keep your eye on it, you, you just miss it. And then poor execution is another one when people have a plan, but they haven't followed through in their head. You know, like me, I I hadn't followed through in my head. What happens if you get into the exam and you spend one hour on the first 20 questions or you spend one an inordinate amount of time on the first few questions? I didn't plan for that. So I went in and instead of finding my gimmies and moving on, I, I started worrying about, oh, these questions, I don't know this. And I worried for an hour until I changed my execution. The execution needed to have been, find your gimmies, Phil. And I thought that's what I was doing until I woke up in question 20. One hour had gone by and poor Phil, it looks like he's going to fail this exam because he spent one hour on 20 questions. What I should have done is find my gimmies by practice. You got to practice, 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 practice the plan. You know, other things under the poor execution, people just being ignorant of the exam. Impatience is another one. Uh, just wanting to get out of the exam quickly. So you speed through it like a speed demon, only to realize everything was was wrong that you thought was right. I've 
had a lot of students rush out of the exam. Like, why are you rushing? You got all this time, three hours for CAPM, almost four for PMP. Why are you doing that? Another reason is a lack of accountability and enthusiasm, which is why I'm always telling you week by week, let me know how you're doing. Let me know where you are. All right. So the chief reason for failing is they don't survey the landscape. If you want to pass the exam, you got to survey the landscape. You got to converse, just like we're conversing with Farouz. She's been there. She's done that. Or you converse with me or anyone else. It builds confidence. People who have been there, done that. They've got the best experience to share versus listen to someone that you know, hasn't taken the exam or has been so long in getting in touch with someone that did, but they teach this stuff, which is why I'm always trying to learn from people that take the exam because my exam was eons ago, but I'm always learning what is the latest and greatest. You're also going to have people giving you practical tips that are not in the manual, just like I'm giving you a practical tip, find your gimmies. They don't tell you that. You got to find your gimmies aggressively and you got to hunt them down, you know? So that's what I... I call uh, practical tips not in the manual. The other thing about surveying the landscape, I don't know how many LinkedIn groups you're in or whether you uh, are in tune on social media to people who share their experiences. There's some rather colorful experiences on PMI exams. But I would say if you're on YouTube, search Praise on PMP Lessons Learned. You're going to hear a lot from people like Farouz who've taken the exam and aced it. Part of surveying the landscape is taking a crash course. I have so many little crash courses on YouTube that are free. It's a course on the entire thing. And it's usually anywhere from one hour to three hours. I have a few of those on YouTube, if you look very closely, of course, free. And I talk about rapid knowledge increments. You just want to beef up your knowledge very rapidly in one knowledge area or one aspect. It really does help. And then the shock treatment approach, I use this on my students. You, you might have experienced me just shocking you into the content on day one and taking you through a lot of content so that you are aware of the broad landscape for either PMP or CAPM. The other one that I would say you need to do is chart the course. You've got to finally analyze what is involved. You've got to read your handbook. If you haven't, do it. you got to understand course duration. You're already in the course, so that's already a given. Uh, and understand the exam duration and rules. So people who are getting into this stuff newly understand the life cycle of the course. The way our course works, we give you a dose of Agile, kind of like shock treatment, welcome to the world of Agile. Then today, we're going to begin progressing to the world of predictive. So that making that transition, understanding how a course is built. And then towards the end, for those who are doing PMP, we talk about hybridization, but CAPMs don't need to worry about that. And then the effort required, ask yourself, be honest, how much time do I need to study for, you know, and things like that. All right, moving on to the third one here, research the exam and questions, get into the writer's heads, read the exam content outline, it's going to help you be inquisitive about the exam and leave no stone unturned. All those knowledge areas, integration, scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communication, risk procurement, stakeholder, they're all going to help you towards the final thing. And lastly, boom, like Farouz, you don't even need to open your PMBOK guide anymore. F Farouz, have, have, have you opened your PMBOK guide since you got certified? No. <laughs> uh, there you go. No. So this, this is the I'm... picture you want. You want the picture of passing the exam and not being held hostage by the PMBOK guide. Okay. But I am reviewing it with you in the applied <laughs> Okay. Project oh, management master oh, of class. course. <laughs> that is true. Farouz is taking another course with me called Applied Project Management. And we are, you're going to love what I've done to that book, Farouz, because I've put in there stories, anecdotes, and quotes to, to help amplify all of the templates. So it's got about 89 templates. It's got stories about project management, stories about leadership, and it brings the Pemba guide to life. I'm really excited about that book. So I take elements from these, you know, I like writing a lot of fiction kind of stuff. This is a, like a fiction book about a, a leader that was no good. So I take my liking for fiction and stuff and I put it into the book and I have some really cool art that, you know, brings the book to life. So that's going to be fun when it's out, but uh, that's it. Once you are done with the exam, you never 
have to go back to read, although you should, like Farouz. But for anyone who's got questions, anyone who's watching after the fact, that's all the information about Prazion. And um, if you need help, go on down to Prazion.com. Let us know how we can help you. All right. Thank you very much, Farouz. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.